It is not a dream. It is not, I fear, even madness. For far too much has already happened to give me these merciful doubts. Kleiner is a mangled corpse. I alone know why, and is such my knowledge that I'm about to blow my brains out for fear that I shall be mangled in the same way. Down unlit and unlimitable corridors of eldritch fantasy sweeps the black, shapeless nemesis that drives me to self-annihilation. May heaven forgive the folly and morbidity which leads us both to such a monstrous fate. I cannot reveal the details of our shocking expeditions. Our museum was a blasphemous, unthinkable place. Our quest for novel scenes and piquant conditions was feverish and insatiable. Kleiner was always the leader, and it was he who led the way to that mocking, that last accursed spot, which brought us both our hideous and inevitable doom. I can recall the scenes in these final moments. The faint, deep-toned bang of some gigantic hound, which we can neither see or definitively place. I remember how we delved into this ghoul's grave with our spades. We pried it open and feasted our eyes on what it held. Much was left of the object despite the lapse of 500 years. With the wrapped corpse lay a cross of curious and exotic design which had been worn around the sleeper's neck. Immediately upon beholding this cross, we knew that we must possess it. After our return, strange things began to happen. We were troubled by what seemed to be frequent fumblings in the night. On each occasion, investigation revealed nothing, and we began to ascribe the occurrences to imagination alone, that same curiously disturbed imagination, which still prolonged in our ears the faint, far baying we thought we had heard in that churchyard. On the night, I heard a knock at my chamber door. I fancied it Kleiner's. I bade the knocker enter, but was only answered by a shrill laugh, and there was no one in the corridor. <laughs> the horror reached a culmination when Kleiner announced his departure. The presence of the ghastly creature had maddened him. He insisted it was far more than psychosomatic distress that we shared. I plead with him not to leave the safety of our museum walls. Kleiner ignored this. His screams had reached the house, and I had hastened to the terrible scene. The moon was up, but I dared not look at it. What mercy I might gain by returning the thing to its silent sleeping owner, I knew not, but I felt that I must at least try. The baying was loud that evening. I stood again in an unwholesome churchyard, and I approached the ancient grave that I had once violated. I know not why I went, unless to pray or gibber out some insane pleas and apologies, 
to the calm white thing that lay within. Finally, I reached the rotting, damp shawl cover. This is the last rational act I ever performed. For crouched within that sentried clock, as the bony thing my partner and I had robbed, not clean and placid as we had seen it then, but covered in caked blood and leering sentiently at me with phosphorescent sockets and ensanguined jaws yawning it twisted in mockery of my inevitable doom. I merely screamed and ran away idiotically. I discarded the wicked cross from my hands. Madness rides the star wind. Claws and teeth sharpened on centuries of corpses, dripping death astride. Now, as the baying of that dead, fleshless monstrosity grows louder and louder, and the stealthy whirring and flapping of those accursed web wings circles closer and closer, I shall seek with my shotgun the oblivion which is my only refuge from the unnamed and unnameable.